All right, so now we're going to finish the last piece in the ipso puzzle. If you recall, we had our ipso, which stood for, so we had input, and then below that we had processing, and then below that we had storage, and then finally output. Now, ironically, we actually did this in the opposite order. We did output first. We learned how to do write line and, or sorry, uh, print line and print, and then we learned how to create variables and store that data. Then we learned how to apply expressions and complex calculations. And now, finally, today, we're going to learn how to actually get information from the user, this idea of input. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the semester that basically every single computer only does these four operations. Every single program you do will always do these four operations. And it's always going to do them in this order, with very, very few exceptions. Now, there is times where, for example, in games, where they'll do it repeatedly. So, for example, every frame of a game, which is 60 frames per second, will do this entire process. It'll check to see whether the user clicked any buttons. It may, it may update the player's position and stuff like that. It will store all that data. And then finally, it will display the results in graphical form and audio form to us, sometimes even vibration as well. But what is input? When we're talking about input, what input is the opposite of output. So if output is when data comes from the computer out to the user, this is the opposite way. This is when the user sends information, not just the user, but any outside source really, but typically the user sends information from their world into the program. That could be something as simple as if you're uh, using a calculator, you type in the numbers you want to uh, work with, you type in the operator and you hit equal sign. That's all input. You entered some operands, you entered an operator and you said go and then it did the work. For our purposes, we are gonna look at the same idea. Now there's, there's a lot of different forms that input can come into a computer, whether that's a microphone for sound, or a camera, or a scanner, um, or some form of optical sensors that like VR uses to recognize motion, that kind of thing. Uh, positional data as well from a mouse or a touch screen. Uh, but the number one form by far that any program uses is still text from a keyboard. And that's probably not going to go away anytime soon. Um, eventually it probably will. It'll probably just get replaced with maybe like speech or whatnot. But for now, text is the dominant form. So this is where we're going to focus on today. And then later on in the semester, um, we'll look into the idea of um, other forms of input, like uh, doing using mouse control and whatnot when we start building games. Now, the devices will dictate the type of input that we're sending in. So a mouse, for example, is going to send in positional and click data. Uh, the internet is just going to send in uh, information in terms of like image information of what to, what to show on the screen, that kind of stuff. And the keyboard is going to give the individual key presses, that kind of, stuff, that kind of thing. So what we want to do now is we need to understand that every single program uses the input differently. So if I'm using a program like Microsoft Word and I hit the W key, well, what happens? The same thing that happens if I hit the W key here inside of Eclipse. I hit W, I get a W show up because it's a text editor. At the end of the day, it's just a text editor. But what if I'm playing a game like Fortnite or Call of Duty or Halo or whatever it is? If I hit the W key on my keyboard, it doesn't write a W on the screen. It makes my character move forward. That's a totally different experience. What that means is that what we send in an input is context sensitive to the program currently operating because that's the program that gets the input. The difference is the operating, says, the operating system says, well, which program is currently running? Send them the input. And then it's up to the program to decide what to do. For our programs, depending on what we're doing, maybe that's we're just getting somebody to write their name. Maybe we're getting them to enter their age. Maybe it's a game and we're saying move forward with our character. We get to decide what that actually means. Now, how does Java actually do input? I'll be honest, Java does it a little bit more complicatedly than most other languages, but it's still not all that um, daunting. It's only five steps, uh, three of steps, three of the steps are just kind of set up, and then it's just doing the same two steps repeatedly over and over and over again. So let's start off with the first thing. Now, to understand is uh, to understand this, we have to realize that we are only working with uh, functionality that already exists. We're not creating it from scratch. So we are going to use a library that has already implemented the back end of this logic. That library is called the scanner library. So at the very top of our program, above our class line, we are going to do an import statement. Import java.util.scanner, capital S. 
that says this is the library we're going to use. So we're going to create a scanner object. Now a scanner object is made to scan the keyboard for input. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to go inside now, inside of our class. Now we can choose to create a global variable or a local variable for this. It's up to us. If I'm going to create it globally, I have to make sure I use the keyword static. But in our case, we're, we're only working in the main method right now. So let's create it locally inside of our main method. So just like before, all of our variables are always created at the top of our methods. So in this case, I'm creating an object. And this is the first time you've ever created an object. Creating an object always follows the same pattern. First thing, the data type for the object is the type of object it is. In this case, a scanner. Right? So it's not an int, it's not a boolean or a, a string or anything like that. It's a scanner. And now we got to give it a name. In this case, remember names need to be descriptive of their purpose. In this case, I'm using it for input. So I'm going to call it input. It makes my life easy. Now the final step for creating any object is telling it to create a new version of this. So we're going to say equals new scanner. And now we have to tell it where it's getting this, where it's scanning the data from. In this case, it's, sta it's scanning it from the basic system itself, the program. So we're going to say system.in. Alright, so now we have our object. That's the first two steps done. Every program you build is going to need these, pro these uh, lines of code. Now you only need one input object, one scanner object, for all of your input in the entire program. You don't, you don't need to create a new one for every piece of data you're going to get. You only need the one. And there we're just going to reuse it over and over and over again. Okay, so the next piece of the puzzle is to realize that we're going to be retrieving data from the user. So we need to create variables in order to store that data. Hmm. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I need to know what kind of data I'm going to be asking the user for. So if I'm going to be asking the user for, let's say, for example, their name. Well, how would I normally create a variable to store somebody's name? I would want it to be a string. We'll call it user name. Maybe I also want their age. So we'll create an int. We'll call that user age. So this is just like creating normal variables. And nothing has changed based on what, we're, what we've done before. It's exactly the same thing. The only difference is instead of us manually assigning it a value like, I don't know, um, Jerry or something like that, that is us manually assigning a value. Instead of that, we're going to retrieve the data from the program. Now, there are um, two final steps. So these are, the, these are the three setup steps that I talked about before that you're going to have to do. You're always going to have to import the scanner. You're always going to create the scanner object. But after that, it's just a matter of creating the variables you need to store the data that you're going to retrieve from the user. And now it's the same two steps over and over and over again. For every piece of data we want, for every piece of input that we want to do, what we want to do is we want to do two steps. Number one, we're going to ask for that data. The proper term we use in programming is prompt. It means give them direction or ask them a question for what they want specifically. And be short, be concise, be precise. So if you want to ask them for, say, for example, a measurement, you might give them a unit as well. It might be something like enter height. And you might give them a unit like meters or something like that. Um, and you know what? Let's do that. So let's say instead of age, let's say height. We're going to get the user's height and we'll use a double because we'll ask for it in meters. So as I said, so step one is going to be ask. Step two, after you ask, you're going to read in that data. So that means retrieve it. Okay, how? How do we do that? Well, there is one command to actually do this. First of all, we know how to prompt. Prompting requires us to use system.out.println or system.out.print. So let's say, for example, I want to ask the user for their name. So I might say, say system.out.print. Now I could use print line. Let's use print line first just to show you the difference. Print ln. And then I got to give it the text that I want to display. So let's say, for example, just name. And you'll notice that I put a little colon and then a space after there. So this is a prompt. This is me indicating to them that I want their name. This is something that's common to users. I could be a little bit more verbose if I want. I might say something like enter name. Sure, if, that, if I want to say that, that's okay. We just don't want to get overdone. We don't want to be asking them questions in the form of sentence or anything like that because that takes too long for the user to understand. So we want to keep it as simple as possible. So I did step one there. 
Step two says, now I need to read it in. So for every piece of input we're going to get from the user, it's always going to be ask, read, ask, read, ask, read. So now I have to read it in. How? So in order to read, the command we're going to use is input.nextLine. That is going to be the command that we're going to use. Let me get rid of this bracket here. All right. So we need to use input.nextLine. And that will retrieve whatever the user types in for us. All right. So I go input dot next line. Now this is going to give me whatever they type in. It's going to let them type. And when I hit enter, it's going to actually retrieve that and bring that back to me. But if I don't store this value, it's, th it's gone. I've just thrown it away. So I need to store it in my variable. In this case, username. So I say username is assigned whatever they type in. Remember how this operates. The assignment statement will not occur until the right side has finished evaluating, which means it's just going to sit there on this line of code forever until the user actually finishes typing and they click enter. So to display our results, let's do it down in our output section. Down here I might say system.out.println, something like uh, your name is... And then we'll add on, we'll concatenate the username onto that. Just to see that we actually get this right. So now if I run my program down here, you can see my prompt. I'm just going to click down here and oops, and I'm going to write in uh, Trevor. You'll notice where I'm typing. It's typing below because I used print line and it forced the cursor down to the next line. I click enter and it gives me the actual output. Your name is Trevor. Awesome. That's really good. It is a little big. So I'll be honest with you, I don't normally use print line for my prompts. I typically just use print. And I'll show you the difference. So now when I run this, now I prompt, when I when I type, the, the console, the uh, sorry, the cursor is actually on the same line. You can see that it's a lot more clean. Now, typically speaking, we're going to want to create a little bit of space between our, our input of our data and our results. So maybe I'll display an empty line here right afterwards. Println, oops, system.out.println. And we'll just put some quotes here. So it just prints a, prints a blank line. I could just as easily put a slash n in there. That would work too, but I'm going to keep it separate so my uh, output statements are clean. I'm going to run this, and now we'll put Trevor here again. And now we've separated that output. Okay, so this is how we get input. Great. Now let's get that let's get that user height from them. So we're going to ask them again. System .out. Now I'm going to keep this code together, um, and the reason why I'm keeping it together is because both of these pieces of information I'm asking the user for are related to the user's personal information. If they were unrelated, I might create a gap in my code here, just to separate it. So um, as a reader of the code. It's not, um, it's not clear. Let me just pause. So it's, uh, so it's not, uh, so it's clear that what belongs with what. But in this case, the name and the user heights are directly related with one another. So I might say something like enter, oops, typing in the middle of nowhere here. Enter height. And now I'm going to give them a unit so they know what uh, unit I'm expecting. And I'm going to put that space at the end so it actually looks like they're typing. And now I need to read it in. All right. User height is equal to input dot next line. All right. Oh, I got an error. That's interesting. Why would I get an error? Here's why. If I hover over this, type mismatch cannot convert from string to double. Here is the kicker, ladies and gentlemen. Next line will always give us a string, no matter what, even if we're asking for a number, because it doesn't know that. It's our. Sorry about that. It's our job is our job is to ensure that the data retrieving is stored correctly. So since our user height is a double and this is a string, what do we need to do? We need to convert. Oh, good. We just learned how to convert the other day. So in order to convert this to the proper data type, I need to make sure that I know where I'm going with it. So for example, I want to I want it to be a double. So I got to say double dot parse double. Oops, got to spell it right. And then I'm going to put brackets around this whole thing. Okay, my error is gone. Let's kind of break this line of code down. 
The first thing that's happening on this line, remember it can't do this equal sign until the right hand side is completely evaluated. It can't do parse double until input dot next line is evaluated. So it's going to wait for the user to type. The user is going to type in whatever their height is. Then it's going to retrieve that as a string. Maybe they type in something like, I don't know, let's say 1.75 meters. But that's going to come to us like this, a string, 1.75. Now we're going to convert that into a double, which will then convert that into 1.75. Now, finally, this whole thing has been evaluated to 1.75 and it gets stored in user height. You notice that the user doesn't type in the M or anything like that. That would break things because we wouldn't be able to convert it into a double. So that's the key. Gets the input, then converts the input, then creates the, then it stores it into user height. All right, let's try this out. So, oh, we should probably display it. Um, we'll add another line here at the end. Do, and we'll say you are, and now we'll concatenate their height, and we'll say put their units on meters tall. It's a nice little period at the end. All right, so let's try running our program. Name Trevor, height 1.75. Now, when I hit enter, we get your name is Trevor. You are 1.75 meters tall. So it actually gets it and converts it. You know what though? The light, the world is not perfect. We have to realize that. And you know what's gonna happen is sometimes you're gonna go like this. You're gonna say, please enter your name. They're gonna write in Trevor. And they're gonna say, and you're gonna write enter height, but they're not paying attention. So they're gonna write in their last name. And we break our program. And this is because you can see the error here, number format exception. It tells us on line 18. Well, where's line 18? Right here. What happened is the user typed in the word lane. And then it said, let's try and convert lane to a double. Obviously that fails. We get the square peg in the round hole. Does not work. So it actually crashed our program. So unfortunately, we have to realize that the user is not perfect. And we have to be, try and protect ourselves from this. So later on in the course, we're going to learn how to do what we call error handling, which is to verify that the data uh, that we're working with is always safe. In this case, it's not at the moment. Um, but we're going to assume for now, which is never a safe assumption in reality, that what they're doing is going to be safe. Okay? So all your assessments and things like that, I will clearly say... I will clearly say something like you can assume valid input from the user and then you'll know that yes you're actually going to get a number um, in with respect to the input okay all right so breaking it down ladies and gentlemen bring it all together in order to do input from the user we need to add the scanner we need to create the scanner object we need to create variables to store the input from the user for every piece of data we need to ask and read in so we need to prompt them for the data first we need to retrieve that data if necessary we also may need to convert that data if necessary we can continue doing processing and storage after this point depending on the type of program these comments are, in, are here just for our own uh, purposes right now so what I'm going to do uh, for the next part of this video is I'm going to run through an example of something a little bit more complex. Uh, we're going to start over here and something a little bit more complex so you can see us actually working through a full problem. All right, and I'll write the problem at the top so we can uh, know exactly what we're trying to do. All right, so here's the problem. We want to calculate the cost to seed a yard. All right, now, write, as it says, write, write a program that can calculate the cost to seed a rectangular yard. Do we know the size of the yard? Nope. So we're going to ask the user for the length and width of the yard in meters. We're going to ask the user for the cost of one bag of grass seed. The only thing we know is that one bag of grass seed covers two meters squared of space. Okay. So whenever you get a problem like this, the first thing you should be doing is trying to break the problem down. Ask yourself a few questions. These are very similar questions you ask in math class when you're about to start a word problem. Same thing with science class. Ask yourself this. What do I know? Is any of it constant? Well, looking at what I'm given here, the only thing I know is that one bag of grass seed covers two meters square of space. 
Maybe it's constant, maybe it's not. Probably it is though, because the companies don't typically change the size of their bags or you'll buy a different size bag. So in this case, we're gonna assume that it's constant. So that means we can create a constant variable for that. So that means up in our class, we could say static, final. In this case, um, we know that it's one bag of grass seed covers two meters squared of space. It's really how much area it covers, right? So we could say something like static, final, We'll use a double and let's call it, um, let's say seed area, seed area. And we'll give it the value of 2.0. All right, so that's the only thing we know and we know that it's constant. Now we need to figure out, well, what is it that we need to calculate? These represent the variables that we want. All right, so these are our variables. Now. Sometimes they are variables for calculations, but we may also need variables for input, what we're gonna retrieve from the user in this case. All right, let's, let's go down here. So we wanna calculate, well, we gotta calculate, we're trying to calculate the cost to seed the yard, but in order to know that, we need to be able to calculate the area. All right, so we need a variable for area, double area. What else? Well, in order to calculate the area, we need the length and the width. Oh, so let's go up a little above this because these are gonna be our input variables, so we'll define them first. So we need one for our length. Since we're asking it for in meters and the, very, the odds of them having a specific meter length is very wrong. So we're gonna say double length and we're gonna have double width. All right, so I can calculate the area using this information. Is that enough? Do I need to calculate anything else? Well, I'm, the whole point of this is to calculate the cost to actually seed. So I'm gonna need a variable for cost. Now I'm gonna separate this. Yes, it is a number, another variable that represents calculations, but it's not really related to the area and the, uh, and the length and the width because those are all about dimensions, whereas this is about money. All right, do I need to know anything else? Hmm, I'm not sure. So we'll come back to this. Maybe we will have to come back, we'll have to define some more variables. So let's start our IPSO process. IPSO says the first thing we need to do is input. But I'm gonna pause you there. That's not enough. If I start my program and the very first thing that we see in the program is something like, please enter your length. Length of what? Why? Why am I giving you the length of my yard? What we need to do is we need to introduce the user to the program. So this is the one exception to the rule of the IPSO order. When we first start a program, we typically want to introduce them to what is going on. Now, sometimes that's just a title and the title is enough. It might be something like, um, it might be something like rectangle, rectangle area calculator, but that wouldn't work for this because that's not what we're doing. Sometimes we need to be a little bit more specific. It might be an instruction or a command, but most times a title will do. In this case, we'll do something like this. We'll say uh, system.out.print ln, let's say calculate the cost to seed your yard. And we'll put a little slash n there at the end to space out the title from the rest of it. If I wanted, I could put a little underline on that, maybe do a whole bunch of equal signs or something, but we'll keep it simple for now. If I wanted to add color, I could add color to highlight certain key data. And that's a lot of what we do. The output uh, to the user needs to be as clear and concise and user-friendly as possible. So there are three aspects that really apply to making something user-friendly okay, in terms of the display of it. So is the data cleanly aligned? Is it laid out in an obvious way? And are you highlighting information in a proper way using spacing and, high, and coloring and whatnot? Okay. So those are the key things that we want to look at when we're displaying information. So back to what we were talking about. We've just introduced the user to the program. So now what we want to do is we want to get on to the next part of the program, which is getting the information from the user. Well, the only thing we're asking the user for in this question is, well, we're going to ask the user for the length and width of meters, and we're also going to ask the user for the cost of one bag of grass seed. Oh, we didn't create a variable for that. So let's go up here and create one. Double, let's say seed cost, or let's say bag cost, because it's one bag bag cost. Don't know what that's going to be yet, but we'll figure it out. So as before, I've already added the scanner stuff, so we don't need to add it again. For every single input, I have to go through the ask read process. So let's start that out. 
system.out.print. If I could type properly. And we'll say something like um, yard length. Give them a unit so they know. And now we can just read that in. And now this is a number. What kind of number? It is a double. So I have to make sure that I'm converting when I read it in. So my length is going to be assigned double dot parse double. And then inside of that, I could say input dot next line. And we'll assume that the user is entering in valid data from the right now. Now the good news is, is that length and width are basically the same thing. So I can ask them, I can just copy and paste these two lines. And we'll just switch our prompt out and our variable out. Yard width, and down here we'll say width. And now we're done that one. Now that's not enough though, because we also have to ask them for the cost of one bag of seed. Now this is not related to the dimensions of the yard, so I'm going to separate this a little bit. So down here, I am going to say system.out.println. I just can use print again, sorry. And we're going to say something like, um, let's say, let's say grass seed cost. per bag. And of course this is in money. Got an extra T on there. That's a little bit more verbose than I would like. So I'm going to say something like just grass, let's say grass, let's say um, seed bag cost. So we already know, we already know that we're working with grass seeds. So we're going to say seed bag cost. And we get, bring that down. Quite a bit. There we go. And now we got to read it in the same way we did before. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. This is money, so it's going to be a double as well. But I'm just going to change this to bag cost. There we go. So now we're done our input process. We don't need to get any more information from the user. Now it's time to do processing and storage. So what do I need to calculate first? Well, I can't do anything unless I know how big my yard is. So I got to go on to the next step. I got to calculate the size of my yard itself. So we know that the area of a yard or the area of a rectangle is just length times width. Okay, so let's do that. So let's say area is equal to length times width. We now know this. So this is going to give us some unit of measure in meters squared. Okay, remember our goal. Our goal is to calculate how much seed and then the cost of that seed. So I guess what I need to do now is figure out how much seed I need. How do I do that? Well, let's think about this. We know that one bag of seed covers two square meters. So if I take my entire area and I divide it by that, that'll tell me how much seed I actually need. It'll tell me how many bags I need. So let's do that. We need to create a variable for this. So let's create a variable down here. This is related to the, to, uh, the area. So we'll say double uh, required seed. All right, so let's calculate that. So required seed is going to be equal to the full area divided by that constant up there, how much, how much area one bag of seed covers, seed area. All right, now, why is this giving me an error? Cannot be resolved. Did I type it wrong? I don't think so. I did. There we go. So that's going to tell us how much required seed we have. Hmm. But will it really? Let's say, for example, my area is um, 6.4 square meters. If I divide that by 2, that's going to give me 3.2 bags. Wait. I can't go to the store, I can't go to Home Depot and say, give me 3.2 bags of grass seed. They're just going to look at me funny and say, what are you talking about? I actually have to re realize and bring common sense into this. And common sense says, you can't buy part of a bag, which means you got to buy a full bag. Oh, well, I can't buy just three bags because then I'm not going to be able to cover the area. So that means that I need to round my data up. Okay, we can do that. So on the next line, let's figure out, so now we're going to calculate how many actual bags we need. So we can create another, now remember, we are going to buy full bags. So we can create, this can be an integer. 
let's say num bags. And down here we can calculate that. We can say num bags is equal to our required seed, but we want to round that up. Now if you remember from our math lesson, we have to use the math dot seal method. <coughs> Pardon me. Now the problem with that is that that is going to give us the result in double. And obviously we can't store a double inside of an integer because it doesn't fit. We're trying to shove 64 bits into 32 bits and it has decimals. We can't deal with that. Even if the decimal is 0 0.0 now. So what we have to do is we have to cast. We're just going to cast this to an int and it will just cut off that 0, 0.0. So now we have, oh this should not be num bags, this should be required seed. My bad. There we go. So this is, gives us the specific amount of seed we need in decimals of bags, and this one will give us the actual number of bags we need. And the final cost is just simply multiplying the number of bags by the cost of one bag. Okay, so our cost is going to be equal to our num bags multiplied by our bag cost. And that will give us a nice number in uh, decimal format. Okay, well, we've done input. There's our input. We've done our processing and storage. And the final step of the puzzle is to output. So now we get into what we want to display. What is it that we want to display? Obviously, we want to display the cost, the final cost to the user. So we could say something like system.out.println. Let's say cost. Let's say uh, yard seed cost. So we give them some nice format. They know exactly what they're getting here. And now we can concatenate that with our actual cost here. So let's give it a try and let's see what we come up with. Let's run our program. I'm going to make this grow a little bit here. Let's run it. No errors, so that's good. Calculate the cost to seed your yard. Length. Let's say 3.7548 or 3 meters. And the yard width, hmm, let's say it's a long yard. So let's say it's 12. 86 or 8742. Oops, that was it. Let's add a couple more decimals just because. And now it's going to ask us the seed bag cost. Hmm, let's say it is, seed is expensive, $18.93 per bag. So there is our final cost. Yard seed cost is $473.25. That's not bad. Well, it's actually really expensive. But, um, the point is, is that it's calculating things accurately. If we think about the cost of this, roughly 12 times 3 is about 36. And then 36, um, that's our area. And since we're dividing it by 2, because one bag covers 2 square meters, that's roughly 18. And then we do 18 times 18. That's a, that should be around 473.25. That should be about good. All right. So our math looks pretty accurate. Now we did get lucky here in the form that we only ended up with two decimals. There's no guarantee that we're actually going to get two decimal places here. Um, and money should be two decimal places. So this would be one of those times where you would definitely want to round your data to two decimal places just by common sense because we shouldn't be showing more than two for money. So what I would do is up here, I might create something like double round rounded cost. And then down below, we would do our normal rounded strategy. We don't want to round the actual money because we might need it for something else later. So we could say rounded cost is equal to math.round. And what are we rounding? We're rounding our cost, but we want to multiply that by 10. So, or sorry, by 100, so we get two decimals. And then we're going to divide the result by 100.0. So we always end up with exactly two decimal places. Um, and down here, we would display rounded cost. Now let's be honest. Looking at this output, I can see that there is all the stuff that I typed in. But then my final output itself was basically jammed right in with my input. That's not ideal to be perfectly honest. So I would want to look at that and maybe clean this up a little bit. So first of all, I could start by separating my, my results from my input. So I could do a blank line, system.out.println. And that's great. But now I want to use some common sense and say, well, is this all that the user actually cares about? Now, I know the program just asked for the cost, but 
Is that all that's useful to the user? Think about this. If you're the person who's, who's seeding their lawn, do you not think it would be a little bit more important for you to actually verify this data as well? You're... You're just we're told a cost, but you still have to go to Home Depot to actually buy the buy the seed. So what other piece of information would be important to you? How about the number of bags to buy? That would be pretty useful. Do you need the area? Mm, maybe, but it's not as necessary as that number of bags. So let's go with that. Let's add that extra piece of data on there for them as well. System.out.println. Uh, let's say bags required. This is going to be useful information for them. And we'll just concatenate on that with uh, num bags, which is the exact number of bags they need. So let's try running this again. I'm just going to clear my stuff. And we'll give it some weird numbers. Let's say 11.2386, whatever. And let's say mm, 4. Point blah, 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 blah. And we hit enter. Seed bag cost will make you a little bit cheaper today, 13.93. All right, so we still got our two decimals, which is great news. Um, and we were told exactly how many bags we actually require, which is 27 in this case. So that is pretty good. We're getting every piece of information we want. I can clearly see that this is separated. Now, if you are working in, um, if you're working in, Replit or on another tool outside of Eclipse that can recognize or a newer version of Eclipse You do actually have the ability to clear the console Sometimes instead of like just putting a blank line um, You may actually want to clear the console and you can clear the console with the following command I don't expect you to memorize this, but it has been in a few of our notes So just a system.out.print and then this kind of mess it's an escape sequence that is supposed to clear the screen. Now, it hasn't been working on the Eclipse on the school computers because they use a really old version of Eclipse. But let's see if it works here. I'm going to get rid of this line. And we'll try this again. Let's say no, no, 3.2 and 5.7. And we'll make it 13.99. So this one, it's still not working on this, on this version of Eclipse as well. So normally what it would do, it would delete at this point all the stuff up to here. In this case, that would mean all this would just go away and the cursor would go back up to the top of the screen. Now, that is both good and bad. On the good side, you have a clean view of all the results. On the bad side, sometimes the input is important information for the user to know so they can visually verify that what they're seeing is accurate. So it would be a good idea to maybe, if you're going to do that, also restate the data that they entered in a very clean and clear way. So I might say, here's the length you entered, like length colon blah, width colon blah, cost of cost or seed cost blah. And then they know what they typed in and it's formatted much simpler and clearer and then you can give them the results after that. It really depends on the program that you're building. And the last piece of the puzzle that I want to point out there is you'll notice that my output came out to 139.9. That's not really normal for us in terms of how we interpret money. That should be 90 cents, so 0 0.90. At this point in the course, we haven't learned how to force that yet. So if you do get that weird situation where there's a trailing zero, just ignore it for now and we'll figure it out later on. No, we're, no need to uh, rush it or anything like that. Okay? So that's it for now. You've gone through a complex problem. We went through full IPSO process. We learned the steps to kind of get started and uh, how to cleanly organize and format our program. In this case, I probably wouldn't do the clear screen though because otherwise we're going to have to restate all that data. That's it for now. Good luck.